Um, today, I'm going to have, within the limited time, I'm going to talk about the general constraints on what, are, what the emission mechanism could be from these two aspects, from the energetics, which everybody should do, you know, from the first, print, from the first second, you think about FRBs, and then from the propagation, which is a little, more, a little more involved. So from, as Lorenzo already talked about, there are generally two classes. You can classify one of the classes in the more general way, saying that it's a maser. There are generally two classes of coherent emission as required by FRB at high brightness temperatures. And what happens is that in the, in the maser situation, you have population inversion in an extended or uh, uh, in, in any medium, basically, you have an extended medium where you have population inversion such that your wave can grow from an initial small amplitude seed. And then another mechanism, those are two general mechanisms. The other mechanism is that you have spatial bunching of your particles within a small volume uh, small wavelengths, uh, smaller than the wavelength, such that there are m particles emitting at the same time, such that the total amplitude goes as n, and the total flux goes as n squared. That's how you get the high flux. Uh, so let's go to the energetics. Uh, first, uh, there are many ways you can make FRBs. I'm generally considering these two scenarios as the most likely ones. There are other scenarios. So the first one is the emission comes from the, within the magnetosphere of a neutron star. The second one is that it's from a relativistic outflow, which dissipates energy at large distances, as we already talked about. There are many other options, which I consider as less likely, but they are possible. If you look at the emission, if you want the emission to be within the magnetosphere of a neutron star, you need to satisfy the energetics such that your wave energy density has to be smaller than your energy available within the magnetosphere, which constrains uh, um, your radius of emission. It has to be close enough within your, uh, to the surface of a neutron star within about tens to 100 neutron star radii. And from that, you can immediately get uh, this hierarchy situation where the plasma frequency is much higher than the wave frequency. And the uh, cyclotron frequency even, is even higher. There is a many orders of magnitude hierarchy in these uh, three frequencies. Okay, these will have implications on all sorts of masers that could occur within the neutron star magnetosphere. And in the other scenario, in order to satis satisfy the time scales of FRBs, you need to invoke some Lorentz factor that is you know, significantly larger than one, such that you can have dissipation at large distances while, where, where, while keeping the duration short. Okay, so looking at this, it's a busy plot, but looking at this single scenario where you are, the emission is within the magnetosphere, what you see is that due to this hierarchy, one can easily go through the, you know, the major mechanisms that have been proposed for the pulsar radio emission many, many decades ago. You can go through those. Uh, there are many other proposals. Those are just three of them I, 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 I uh, selected as the so-called most likely ones. But you can find that they all, they, they, they all require fine-tuning. Let's say if you let's say, took, take a look at the curvature maser situation where uh, a lot of people have worked on, including Roger. Uh, the, 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 the curved magnetic field cannot be confined in a plane. It has to have torsion, out-of-plane torsion. Even in that scenario, the maser cone is within 1 over gamma squared tiny cone. That, that amount of fine-tuning you need in order to generate FRBs. You need all B fields to be parallel. Uh, there are lots of other fine tunings that you need in order for other major mechanism to work. So this is another mechanism for the so-called antenna mechanism where you have charged bunches moving along field lines uh, emitting curvature radiation. So very simple calculation that one can do is that in those situations, those are like antennas. Because antennas, the ch uh, you have oscillating currents the actual power is not from kinetic energy of particles. It's from the EMF. It's from the source, which is supplying the current. Basically, it comes from an electric field, which is, which is parallel to the B field, driving the motion of the charge bunches. And it, it can easily show the isotropic equivalent luminosity is roughly of order E squared and the curvature radius squared times C. It's a very simple calculation one can very quickly do. And you can easily generate FRB luminosities given that you have a strong electric field. 
Of course, the current would perturb the B field, which require a much stronger B field to sustain the current. So that's, that's the basics about uh, these two uh, mechanisms. Let's look at the energetics and see what are the constraints. Uh, Oh, oh, first, be, because of this uh, curvature, because of this curvature emission, one can immediately look at what is the maximum amount of luminosity that you can get, which is one of the constraints. Which, uh, if you th so, the maximum luminosity is given by the electric field not being too strong. It cannot be more than about 10% of the quantum critical electric field. At that point, you generate Schrodinger pairs. No more, uh, no more electric, no more electric field which will be shielded. So you get uh, something like a maximum luminosity of this, and you can, you know, look at the dm, which is a distance and fluence plot that's that's over there. You can see that there indeed seems to be a lack of those events uh, at high uh, luminosities. So let's look at the uh, relativistic outflow uh, at large, dissipating at large distances. So those are the very general three uh, kind of. Uh, uh, relations that you would generally expect. So the FRB duration is related to the distance of emission by the Lorentz factor, which is well known. And typical frequency for all sorts of plasma measures, there could be synchrotron, there could be other sorts of plasma measures, is roughly related to the plasma frequency. Given that sigma is order unity, this is of order the cyclotron frequency as well, and multiplied by some boosting of gamma. This is related to the density. And the total energy involved in the system is just given by the you know, total rest mass energy multiplied by gamma squared as, the, as they've been shocked. From these three, of course, there are many complications, like there are upstream magnetization one can take into account and composition and different types of masers and pre-shock motion as Andre talked about. You can take all those into account. This would modify this simple relation by of order 10 or a little bit more. Not so much, but this is the general relation that you need. The total energy you need in order to dissipate, in order to have your radius of a dissipation, let's say at 10 to the 13 centimeters, that's the amount of energy you need in order to generate. This, is, this has nothing to do with the maser efficiency or whatever. This is the total energy you need, uh, depending on, very strongly depending on the shock radius. And you can see that for FRBs, you know, this is the FRB energy, uh, efficiency seems to be low unless your radius of emission is smaller than 10 to, minus, 10 to the 13 centimeters. Uh, and this can be accommodated by magnetar flares, easily accommodated. Um, and uh, so th those are from the energetics. Well, those are the conclusions you can get easily. And from the propagation. So first, the propagation within the magnetosphere. Sorry, I'm switching between. Hopefully, you're not so com confused. So in the magnetosphere, the first thing you notice is that the total number of particles, the total rest mass energy of all Gerard Julian density and you multi some multiplicity factor is small compared to the FRB energy. You conclude that the FRB waves are so strong, they are like an elephant running into flies. The flies are not going to stop the FRB radiation. So they basically cannot absorb FRBs within the magnetosphere. What happens in the magnetosphere is that the polarization is modified. So the pol this is a very simple, it has been worked out in the, like the rotating vector model in the, in the past. What we have done is that we accommodate the, the strong wave effect. FRBs are strong waves such that this, uh, Lorenzo defined this as a wiggler parameter, this nonlinearity parameter is much greater than one within the magnetosphere for FRBs. You can take that into account and calculate. So the, the, what happens is that electric field stays perpendicular to the local B field all the time and adiabatically walks until the freeze out radius where the plasma density is low enough such that the plasma is virtually vacuum. So the polarization vector frees out at this freeze out radius, which typically is much less than a light cylinder radius and much larger than the neutron star size. From that, you conclude that the polarization is perpendicular to the magnetic dipole moment, which is periodically rotating around the spin axis. And also, there's a small amount of uh, Faraday rotation in the magnetosphere as well, which for 12, 11, or 2, this is too small to be observed. Uh, but for other cases, there could be some implication. So for the relativistic outflow scenario, what kind of propagation effects you would expect? So this is the general uh, sketch on what the outflow scenario would do. You have a shock. This is a shock running into the pre-shock medium. And after the shock, there could, be per, there could be population inversion in the shocked medium or at the shock, as, uh, as in different scenarios. 
In all scenarios, the FRB radiation comes ahead of the shock because it's propagating at speed of light. So the pre-shock electrons would see a narrow beam of strong, wave, F, uh, strong FRB waves uh, within a narrow cone of 1 over gamma squared. Gamma can be properly defined either as the shock Lorentz factor or the post-shock Lorentz factor, depending on the scenario. But that's what you would expect. Uh, what happens is that uh, there will be induced Compton scattering. Uh, what happens, so there's a, a little bit of detail of what induced Compton scattering do, is that if you have radiation given in one direction, it can get scattered into another direction if there are already photons, if the photon occupation number defined as follows, uh, well-known, uh, which has been worked out by previous people, a lot of previous works. Uh, the probability of being scattered into this cone is much higher if n is much greater than 1. To, for FRBs, uh, a number to, to, to know is that this is of order 10 to the 35. So it's a huge amount of scattering. Of course, you have to subtract uh, the backscattering. There is a little bit difference between forward scattering and back scattering in back to into this cone, depending on the electron recoil. One can take that into account. So the final outcome is that uh, the uh, so because the radiation is beamed, they put an, a momentum kick onto the f uh, the uh, pre-shock electrons, such that electrons are accelerated to a Lorentz factor of order gamma, and that may shut off the major, major emission. So we require that the acceleration is not so... Previously, I will require there is a Thompson, there is an induced Compton optical depth, but this constraint turns out to be much stronger, as we recently found out. This constrains that the shock radius has to be greater than something like 10 to the 13 centimeters, uh, as shown here. So this is the Lorentz factor of the jet running into the medium as a function uh, I mean, the, the kinetic power as a function of shock radius, you can see that only in this parameter space is allowed uh, due to the constraint by acceleration. Uh, so from that, as I previously calculated, you can easily conclude, taking into, all, taking into account all kind of uh, complexities, as I mentioned, you get, you get the conclusion that the energy has to be greater than 10 to the 46 ergs for typical FRBs of this. Those are brighter ones. Those are better than the repeating FRBs, but still typical. Uh, from those, you conclude that the efficiency must be quite low, uh, cannot be 10 to the minus 3. Uh, so, uh, oh, I still have a little bit of time. Let me go a little bit. I uh, have one more, two more minutes. So those are the summary, which I will come back. Uh, so there are also some strong wave effects. Uh, that one might expect, but at distance much larger than 10 to the 14 centimeters. At, that at those radius, let's say 10 to the 17 radius, now I'm considering a very bright FRB, just to emphasize the strong wave effects. The nonlinearity parameter is not so much less than 1, it's 10 to the minus 2, meaning that electrons are oscillating at speed, 1% uh, of speed of light. What are the implications? The first implication is that the rest mass of electrons is modified by of order 10 to minus 4. So that modifies the dm and rm as well. So there will be such a small um, uh, modulation, luminosity dependent modulation. If you, if you got a repeater you know, for different luminosities, you will see such a very tiny, <laughs> which is predicted, has, not, has never been seen, of uh, modulation that you may expect. Oh, also from the 12.1102, I, I kind of, from Laura's talk, one can roughly estimate if this dm and the rm uh, change are uh, due to the same cloud, you can do the ratio. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm sorry, but per year, sorry, per year, sorry, per year, you do the ratio of these two, uh, you get a magnetic field, 10 milligauss, quite high, but not crazy, I would say. And from the RM, which is 10 to the 5, divided by this, you get a local DM. So there is some amount of local DM. So the amount of, uh, you expect 10 to minus 3 of modulation uh, due to strong wave effects. So another thing that you would expect, this is a, a very simple thing, is that the free-free absorption is suppressed because electrons now are oscillating at speed much higher than their thermal speed. Let's say for 10 to the 4 Kelvin, your thermal speed is 10 to the 4 kilometers per second. Right now, uh, for strong wave effects, the oscillating speed can be much higher than your thermal speed. So you see there's a strong suppression 
which go roughly goes as a to the minus three uh, of the free free absorption. This is a this is oh I'm running out of time. I'm sorry. So this is just to show for a given flux or a given luminosity, you see that as you go to as you go to lower and lower frequencies, the initially the uh, optical depth increases and then the optical depth drops. So that is the so I'm going to uh, go to the summary slide and uh, leave for questions. <laughs>